Chris Cullen from Blue Cross of Idaho, who is going to introduce our guest speaker. Thank you, Thank you Annie. I am so thrilled, and uh, I know many of you, I'm most of you here. And as you know, we're so excited about our VR community here and all of the things that we're doing. And I was just Can happy to grab like Chuck. A this evening because I'm like, give, give yes, we time. have our healthcare speaker. We've been talking about it for a couple of years. Um, and then we time. have a speaker, and I am, couldn't be more one excited hour. about this. One hour. So I would like to introduce like Howard Rose. Like he is the CEO for First Hand Technology, a Stanford resident or fellow in speaker. Howard has yes. been a leader in the VR industry like for over 20 years. years. Since his early days in VR for education, Howard has been working new ground Hold on. and developing a vision. <laughs> Can you hear me, right? How about this one? Do you want to come back here? I'm good. truly fortunate to have the opportunity to join the vibrant VR research community at the Human Interface Technology Lab at the University of Washington, right here in the Pacific Northwest, yeah. under the direction of Dr. Tom Turner. Thank you, Howard. The lab is a hive of exploration full of creative tinkerers pushing the boundary dividing human and machine. It's our power. As a graduate researcher, Howard joined the lab's education group led by Dr. W Bill Wynn. Bill led a ragtag team on the virtual reality roving vehicle project driving 100 pound computers around Washington State, giving school children their first taste of VR, inspiring them to dream about how it might be used in the future. Howard was excited about the discovery that we can break the window of the computer monitor and step inside, transferring the way or transforming the way people interact, not just with these boxes we call computers, but more importantly, with the information and knowledge we see. Coupled with his own thesis research, exploring virtual environments for teaching Japanese language, Howard began to focus on a mission putting these technologies and approaches to work to recast teaching and learning. In 1995, Howard and Ari Hollander formed First Hand to follow these goals. Some really quick highlights, and then I'm going to turn it over to Howard. First Hand was a featured health startup in TechMed 2014, where Howard spoke on the topic, VR games are so much more than a toy, asserting that VR games are a new tool for personalized medicine that shifts wellness into the patient's hands. Health consumers, as per Howard, are going to demand innovations that help them stay well on their own, and we all agree. Not just to react to disease, and they're going to demand that these innovations are fun. So I think we saw some of that out there today. Most, re most recently, Howard and his team published VR pain relief, response to the opioid crisis, with Dr. Shorin Nemeth, Medical Director, Pain Services at Providence Medical Group, where they are seeing 30% better pain control, 20% reduction in opioid use, and a significant reduction in patient care costs. His project portfolio also includes immersive VR applications for therapy, PTSD, augmented reality surgical training, mobile apps, and interactive museum exhibits. Howard is a frequent invited speaker at conferences on VR, games, and health. And again, we are thrilled to have him talk with us today. Please join me finally in welcoming Howard. <laughs> Thank you. I, I am blown away. You, you, know, you know way more about me than my mother does. Wow, I'm, I am like totally impressed. You, you did an awful lot of research there. Uh, dug up some, some great history, which some of which I will talk about, but thank you so much. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I do give a lot of talks, and this kind of 
and this is my favorite thing to do, is to talk to people who really understand VR and or have a lot of curiosity about it. Um, I want to talk about, you know, I'm going to try to hit a bunch of different topics, um, not bore you with a lot of statistics, but show you some of the data that we found from using VR. Um, talk a lot about design because I, at my heart, I didn't get into this because I wanted to be an entrepreneur and schlep around and sell things. I got into it because I'm a designer. And um, thank you for that. I, I mean, I started doing um, education and all of that. So I want to talk about those things and talk about design and how I approach the design and thinking about it as a, some, uh, from a design thinking perspective. Um, anyway, I'm going to talk for, you know, probably, uh, I don't know, as long as I talk, but I do want this to be a conversation. So if you do have burning questions, um, you know, please feel free, but we'll have, try to get some discussion at the end. Um, here's what I want to talk about. So uh, what is VR? Why is it, quote, healthy? Uh, that was, uh, you know, why, why, what about it is good for us? Uh, an overview of VR pain relief, a framework for how we think about VR therapy in terms of the mechanisms of action. Um, and I would say that I hope that this, um, what we've learned from VR pain relief is it's a great way to figure out how immersion and the phenomenon of VR works. Uh, but I think this is very, very applicable to a lot of different areas, learning, uh, healthcare, all sorts of different things. So I hope you'll uh, take it in that way. Uh, and then designing VR uh, health experiences. Um, so what is VR? That, as you mentioned, that is my real mother. My real mother could not have given you that, that rundown of my personal history, I will tell you. So this is back, I say this is back when I had a future. Um, this is when uh, the Human Interface Technology Lab, that is that crazy, we called it the pizza box. Um, this is a seven and a half pound helmet uh, it's from a company called Division, which is now, you know, they were hit by the meteors and went the way of the dinosaurs. So, um, yeah, this uh, seven and a half pound helmet. Yeah, so we had this project called the Virtual Reality Roving Vehicle, um, the VRRV. I love that term. Uh, we took machines out across the state of Washington uh, and taught kids to build virtual worlds and catch sharks and in uh, VR and do things like that. And they're wearing this helmet, so the, their first experience of VR was a lot like this. And, and the, this kind of speaks to the, where all this, all this technology that we're using came from was the military. So it was great for people with strong necks. Um, uh, Tom Furness, one of my mentors. Uh, so I don't know how many of you know who Tom is. Um, Tom is like, the father of VR. So he was doing this way back in the, so you know about Ivan Sutherland probably, and, and Tom was doing it back then too in the military. Uh, what's interesting is that, um, so the, how did, he discover this idea of immersion. So they were projecting um, information onto the, the visors of fighter pilots and trying to teach them things, trying to tell them things like, you're flying upside down and stuff like that. Real important things. Uh, uh, just in time information and what they discovered, what they invented was the heads up display. But what they discovered was they started projecting video in there and then they started making the field of view bigger and bigger and bigger and then there was like this point where everything changed and that all of a sudden performance jumped up dramatically and they're like, whoa, what happened? So they discovered this idea of immersion and, and uh, what is it is essentially is that we stop seeing it as a, as a thing that we're looking at and we start seeing it as, or feeling like it's a place that we are. And that is kind of the underlying thing. The, the big under insight was that immersion enhanced human performance. Um, this is my go-to, uh, my go-to, my own uh, definition of VR, it's a computer generated experience that evokes the sensation the experience is real. That can be visual, it can be haptic, it can be a lot of different things. Um, there's a lot more, uh, you know, there's a lot more academic um, kinds of definitions out there, but I think that this one uh, serves me well at least. Um, so when people think of VR and healthcare, they tend to think of this, 
Uh, they, think, they think of um, you know, surgical simulators and things for doctors and all of that. And this stuff is awesome. It's great. Um, but it doesn't address our real big social problems. So in, this, in the United States, uh, we spend 17% um, of our GDP, three, uh, you know, $3 trillion a year, and we get the worst outcomes in healthcare of, of any developed nation. Why is that? We have a lot of this. We have a lot of great surgeons. The doctors are great. We're in a fantastic health facility, but, but it's clearly that, that something's wrong in the system. And I think it's because there's an overemphasis in, our, in both our healthcare system and the way that we look at it and the things that we try to get from it. We see ourselves as health consumers. And VR transforms that into helping us be health producers. And that's kind of the underlying theory that we, we try to bring. So instead of, of giving people opioids, we have this kind of situation where people are activated post-surgery, they're in a bed, they're moving, they're engaged, and we find that, that they use less drugs, um, it reduces costs, and they have uh, actually better pain outcomes. Uh, so the work that we've done very briefly, we've done mental health, uh, lifestyle, sort of health habits, and physical health. Um, I'm going to talk about some of these examples, so I'm just going to run on. Um, uh, you know, our mission is to use technology to improve health by improving the patient experience. So we have done surgical, surgical simulators and things like that, but really we, we see the big benefit in this whole technology really being on the patient side of things. Um, and we design for activation. We don't design for um, distraction. We design to activate the patients and, and help them be healthier on their own. And that's that idea of, of uh, health producers. So uh, VR in this context, reducing pain, reducing drugs, reducing costs, uh, those are the outcomes we're seeing. And that's, um, that's really encouraging for all of us. Uh, just uh, one slide about the pain problem. Everybody has heard about the pain epidemic. This is one statistic that kind of really shocked me. Um, so this is the CDC, uh, maybe you're familiar with this, but what they found was that opioid prescriptions longer than five days, um, so if you're taking drugs for more than five days, it significantly increased the likelihood of continued opioid use one or three years later. So if you look at this graph uh, along the bottom, this is the number of days of opioid prescriptions, and then uh, the, uh, along the top is, uh, you know, along the side is the percentage of people who are using drugs a year or three years later. So there's nothing magical about five days, but what we find is that, I mean, that's significant. So one year uh, risk increases from six to 12%, and, and the human cost is really what we're, what we're most concerned about and the social costs of having all those drugs in the, in the environment. So this finding motivates us. We're, there's an urgent need for non-drug pain relief alternatives and interventions at the right time can have a really dramatic effect. So if we can help people post-surgery to not, you know, to be using drugs less than five days, there's a good chance that we can keep them from sliding into uh, long-term use. Um, uh, I've got a couple of videos that I want to show. This is a story of Lieutenant Sam Brown. He returned from Afghanistan uh, with severe burns. He was in GQ magazine. He's been on, on television a bunch. And he used Snow World. So we built this application, Snow World, with Hunter Hoffman, Dave Patterson, Tom Furness, the, the folks at the Hit Lab. Um, and uh, Snow World's kind of this iconic, um, most, most people in, in VR uh, maybe have heard of it. but. Um, yeah, it's, it's sort of the iconic um, VR pain relief application. It's also the, the really forwarded the use of, uh, of VR in healthcare. Um, and it's being used with patients from, uh, with burn patients from um, the military and from kids in all, all different contexts. Um, some of the data that I'll show is Snow World data, but so this is Lieutenant Sam Brown. And, uh, he came back from Afghanistan, he was severely burned, and these are patients whose, you know, 70% of their body is third degree burns, um, trauma, uh, blast, blast traumas, et cetera. So these, these are really very, very difficult patients, and safe doses of narcotics can't get them through all of their procedures. So they're doing, um, they're changing their bandages every day, they're doing skin stretching, they're doing skin grafts and all of these things, and it's the worst kind of pain that's out there. 
So, uh, you know, patients who are, are, are going through this have three problems. Pain is one, anxiety and helplessness. And we know that uh, your experience of pain changes dramatically when you feel anxiety and, and that loss of agency. And it, ch it changes that experience from just being pain to suffering. And so that's kind of the, the transformation that we want to change. Um, and this is a quick video. It does have some audio. I hope it goes through. Oops, sorry. Uh, I tried to give you sound. That's what happens when you try to make things better in the world <laughs> with technology. Someday I'll tell you about the dinosaurs. Oh my God, that was that was a nightmare. Um, okay, but anyway, so um, just to, oops. This see, this is what happens. Try to make things better, and it gets worse. But um, so what? Uh, I'll just uh, kind of skip through this because. Um, I don't want to take a lot of time. So basically, uh, what I think is interesting, uh, you know, since you guys do know a lot about VR. Uh, so number one, uh, we, uh, number one, it works. And that's really big. I mean, for patients like this, it's, it's giving them a lot of benefit. Uh, number two, uh, this is um, not a head-mounted display. Actually, this is uh, the optics off of a $35,000 helmet. And, uh, oops, oh my God, what happened? <laughs> oh, we're having trauma. Okay, what happened? I think it might have gone to sleep. Oh, it went to sleep. That wasn't my, it wasn't my fault. I feel vindicated. I'll still tell you about the dinosaurs. But, um, that's the HDMI. Uh, no, it's the HDMI is still there, I, I swear. Okay, this is always bring hand puppets. This is what I learned, sock puppets. When you, when the PC ran into the problems and needs to restart. Okay, anybody here from Microsoft? My, my machine, I was doing demos out there and it decided to do an update. I have no idea. I, okay. It looks like it's moving fairly quickly though. Okay, this is why we have hand puppets. And I'll tell you about the dinosaur. So, I, w I was, this is, um, this is, I'm going off script here while this does this. But so I was in um, the, a, a bunch of our, um, my, my colleagues and, and other fellow students at the University of Washington. We went to Japan and um, it did this thing called the Smithsonasaur. Um, and they actually, the Smithsonian Museum gave us permission to use the name. Um, something's happening here. Uh, Bill Gates has now infiltrated my my thing, okay, uh, I don't know. Anyway, so what happened was we went, to, um, we, we went to Hiroshima. So I used to live in Japan. I lived in Japan for seven years and um, I was the only one who could actually speak Japanese, which was also funny because they, we got there and this guy said, okay, we want, so the whole thing was about dinosaurs, right? So we made this thing where you walk into the Smithsonian and there's this, this pteranodon and it's a skeleton and you touch the skeleton and it comes to life and you grab the leg and then it lifts you up into, uh, into the sky and takes you to the land of the dinosaurs and you take pictures and then you come back. And this was in the 1990s and it was crazy because we had a, um, I, I don't know what this is doing here. Um, uh, for some reason, everything, everything, has, everything has gone to hell. But, uh, so this is, um, but, but this, will, this will make you feel better because not, this was absolutely the, the epitome of, of bad technology experiences. So we got to Hiroshima. We're in the middle of Hiroshima and, and in, in the convention center. We set up we, uh, Silicon Graphics. We had like a half a, a half a million dollars of equipment and we got everything set up and we had spent a week at the university there uh, building this stuff. And um, anyway, we set everything up and they said, okay, now we're gonna turn the electricity off. And we're like, you're gonna turn the electricity off? These machines, you know, you didn't, you, did, you never turn them off once you turn them on. So we're like, you can't turn this off. Well, they said, well, this half of the room is on generators and this half is on electricity. We're like, we wanna be on that half. And they just didn't, 
they didn't let us. So what they, they said, okay, you can come in at eight o'clock. And then what they did was they turned on the generators and it sent a power surge through our, our computers and it completely fried. The, the, the cord was, the, the cable was broken and, and it, was, it was a complete nightmare. So we're standing there and then all the press shows up because the, the Americans are here with the Smithsonian thing with the dinosaurs and, and it's gonna be really great. And we're like, oh my God, we gotta fix this stuff. And we had HTML in our, in our C code, it was really a mess. So that is, it, it, it could go on. But um, anyway, the other, the other cool thing was I got to be the dinosaur. And I, my, I, I got to be the Japanese dinosaur. <laughs> Which goes something like this. That means grab my leg. I'm saving you some of it. But um, I'm going to take you to my world. So um, this is the kind of thing you get to do when you're a grad student at the University of Washington. Um, so we're going we're gonna to hopefully get back into it. Uh, that was the sock puppet. That was the moral equivalent of a sock puppet. Um, and so I'm just going to jump ahead here to the cool thing, the brain pictures. Uh, this is another tip that I always give everybody. Uh, there's a psychological study that if you're going to do any PowerPoint presentation, it is way more convincing if you have a picture of a brain someplace in the study. So they did the exact same PowerPoint and then one had a picture of a brain and the other didn't and the, and the one with the brain was way more convincing. So always put a picture of the brain into every PowerPoint you do. Um, so this is uh, data about snow world. So this is what happens in your brain, my brain, our brains, our collective brains, uh, with VR and without VR uh, when we're subjected to pain and stress. So there's what's called the pain matrix, which is these five areas of your brain, of our brains, of brains that uh, are activated when we're under pain and stress. And three of them, the insula, the thalamus, the ACC, um, uh, I won't get into all of these, the, the neuroscience of it, but what's cool is that you see with no VR um, that these areas are really, really active and that with VR you see two really great things. One is that those, that pain matrix becomes a lot quieter. So the, the brain activity is actually moving to other parts of your brain. And that is um, the, uh, the PACC, uh, the cog areas that are associated with cognition, with cool stuff. So this is a great picture that um, corroborates the, the self-report about pain. Um, and we can see that there's actually something very deep happening in our brains when we use VR. Um, and that's really great. Um, another study with, with VR, this was uh, within subjects, uh, fMRIs. Uh, so they actually built, um, Hunter built a $150,000 optical HMD um, to go into an MRI machine. And um, uh, that, that, that's a feat unto itself. Um, but they did a couple studies. Uh, this one compared uh, the, use, the, the outcomes with, uh, within subject, within a patient, within the same patient. Uh, no treatment, opioids, opioids plus VR. I'm just going to look at that. Uh, relationship. So uh, this is comparing VR and opioids to the no treatment control. So uh, pain unpleasantness, um, how bad was it? Uh, so uh, the uh, rating of pain unpleasantness, so negative in this, in this case, is, is better. So uh, the opioids reduced that, that feeling of pain unpleasantness 16%. And the VR was 38%, so we're doing better than the drugs. Time thinking about pain, aka catastrophizing. Um, uh, we're still doing way better than the opioids, and everybody's favorite, the amount of fun. Um, I just love the image of like them going, okay, how much fun are you having in there? Um, while we're inducing pain. Uh, so VR is doing way better than the opioids. And what I think is really interesting is that the opioids are worse than the no treatment control. So uh, that feeling that you get from opioids is actually worse. Uh, people, people like that less than actually just enduring the pain without it. Uh, and I think that speaks to something about, about how we can, um, you know, people just don't want to take drugs. They're looking, for, they're looking for alternatives. So at least in this case, in this study, we can, be, we can say that the VR worked better than the drugs. So we build applications. One is cool, it's out there. Uh, cool is uh, sort of a next generation snow world um, moving through a, um, 
moving through a landscape, we're playing paintball with otters. It's designed to be really, really simple. Uh, one of the problems is that uh, patients who are undergoing these procedures, number one, they're constrained a lot and they're, limit uh, they're limited in their motion, but they're also constrained because mentally they're, they're, a lot of them are taking drugs, a lot of them are stressed out, they've got that anxiety, they've got the, you know, the loss of agency, all that problem. So um, we want to make everything non-threatening, uh, it's designed to be, it runs for about 35 minutes. Um, we have patients, some, some of them, the longest ones are kind of in, an, uh, in there for an hour. Um, some are a lot shorter, but um, they generally try to keep those procedures down to uh, a minimum so people can tolerate them. Um, but, uh, so this is a study of cool, excuse me, um, done at uh, the pain consultants of East Tennessee, Ted Jones, uh, neuropathic pain, so this is looking at chronic pain. What's really interesting, uh, a lot of things. Number one, 94% of the people actually got a benefit, which is huge. 92% um, uh, said they had a benefit after they took the helmet off. Um, and then if you look at the times, they did two, ses they did two different uh, studies. One was five-minute sessions, just a single five-minute session. Uh, pain reduction during VR, 60% uh, and then 33% after they took the helmet off, and that lasted for hours and sometimes up to days later. Um, the 20-minute 20, uh, 20 sessions, uh, three, a series of three 20-minute sessions, the pain reduction during VR was uh, close to 70%, uh, which is great because that shows that it's not a novelty effect. It's not just the, the newness of it, and actually we've, we've what we see is that the more accustomed that people are to, uh, to using VR, the, the more benefit that they get from it. So um, we don't think it's just a novelty kind of thing. And that the pain reduction afterwards was, was even greater, up to uh, above 50% and zero side effects. So, um, or close to it. Um, and this, this guy, he, uh, he actually was um, using opioids for quite a long time. He had very severe, uh, injuries from de uh, Desert Storm. Um, he finally got off of opioids and, and he talks about how opioids just, he never felt good. And the VR makes him feel good when he does it. So VR has a profound lasting effect. It's not just a distraction. And I'll, I'll talk about this in a bit. Um, so we, we uh, another application we have is called Glow. Um, it's sort of a multi-layered therapy, biofeedback, um, we're doing a lot of things at the same time. We're doing biofeedback, we're using a leap motion, so we're getting small motor kinds of uh, motions, we're getting large motor kinds of rehab, um, and then using biofeedback and skills development, uh, helping people uh, sort of at, at a number of different levels. Um, I can talk about this application, but um, I'm gonna try to, try to keep going. Um, how am I doing here? Okay, we'll get some more sock puppets. So this is what it looks like, uh, sort of in, in the hospital context. Okay, so that, that kind of gives you an idea. That's um, so bedside, uh, post-surgery, um, also being used, of course, during procedures and then for chronic pain uh, in chronic pain clinics, uh, different kinds of environments. Uh, we, we have really focused on hospitals and clinics rather than um, trying to take it to people's homes. We have done some of that, but it's really just, it's a lot of work and it's very difficult to, the population that, that 
you know, has the biggest health or, or the biggest pain problem, of course, is older folks, and um, uh, that presents a whole bunch of challenges. Uh, we did do a, a very interesting implementation with Providence Cancer Center, and this is also older folks. So we do see that, that older people can, um, you know, the older set can enjoy VR, and, and we all probably have some experiences of that. But um, so this was pancreatic cancer patients. Pancreatic cancer generally affects people who are 65 and older. Um, Post-invasive surgery, there were 29 patients. Uh, they used Cool and Glow. Uh, bedside, kind of in that way that was in that video, 30% uh, reduction in pain. So this is comparison to historic data, um, what happens, uh, standard of care. So 30% better than the standard of care, which is drugs. Um, and 20% reduction in the use and the need for those drugs, and a strong trend to reduce the cost of care. And so we're, we're doing some follow-up studies with them. We're working with rehab medicine, uh, and, and lots of stuff going on. Uh, this is a, a video of Shore and Nemeth. I think I'm just going to skip over it, but if you look at our website, we're firsthand, firsthand.com. Uh, this, this is a, a really great um, video. Uh, he's a really serious pain doctor. Um, he's, not, he didn't, he's not a technologist. He's not an, oh, wow, I really want to get a whole bunch of technology in my, in my practice. Um, he's the head of pain medicine for, for Oregon, um, for the at least the northern region. So, um, and he, uh, he has seen the value and he really believes it. So, um, that I highly recommend this video. I'm just gonna skip over it. These are some of the places that we're working with. Um, gonna skip over that. I wanna talk some about design and sort of the framework, the mechanisms. Um, VR approaches uh, to change personal experience. Uh, this is, some of this is borrowed from uh, my friend Giuseppe Riva, who I, Highly recommend you check out his stuff. He's great. Um, he's at the Christian University in Milan. Um, uh, so the, th the things that you can do with VR, you can structure, uh, you know, change personal experiences, use VR to structure it with goals, rules, feedback. You can uh, enhance personal experience sort of with multimodal experiences and kind of add, add another dimension, or you can replace it with synthetic experiences. Um, this is very quick, but this is, uh, this is the model. This is called the, uh, the, the Neuromatrix. Uh, it's Melzac and Wall. Melzac is uh, kind of famous in the, in the, um, in the pain world. Uh, but this is, this is, the more I think about this model, the more useful it is. And what it is is that, so on the left side, we've got kind of inputs. When you think about inputs, it's inputs from our body and from, from the outside world. We've got sensory signals, we've got emotions, and we've got cognition. These all, the, the, what's cool about this is we used to think of pain as something that we experience, like you step on a tack and that you're going to, you know, that signal's going to go to your brain. We now know that your brain mediates all of our experiences. And so we take this cognition and our emotion, and then we have outputs, uh, sort of, in, uh, a lot of that's internal. We've got pain perception is an internal output. Um, we've got our actions that we do take in the world, and we've got our own stress regulation of how we handle stress. And so th this is actually a cycle. It's not, it doesn't just move one side to the other. But this is, this is sort of an underlying model, and I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but I do recommend that you kind of check it out. Um, and it overlays with sort of our model for how VR works. Um, VR has five superpowers. That's the way I think about it. It's immersive. It's interactive. Uh, it is a psychophysical experience. It's cognitive, and it also hits us at an emotional level. Um, immersion is where things start. If you're, if you're not immersed and you're not getting it, going back to Tom Furness's uh, head-mounted display, that's where performance and everything changes. So immersion is where it starts, but it's not where it ends. And that's that idea that we want to try to activate people and get them interactive. Um, on the therapeutic side, uh, immersion gives you this opportunity for self-regulation. Down, down regulation, emotion control, all of those things. Uh, and that's good for pain, it's good for mental health. Uh, it's also good for learning, because we, we know how experts learn uh, versus how novices learn. Um, so active, creative uh, studies using Snow World, for example, comparing it to passive media and some with our, our newer applications have shown that, that it's much more effective, that interaction is, is a big component to the effect. Um, oops. 
And uh, sensory learning, body, body map changes our perception of ourself. So we're not thinking about, um, we're not necessarily, we lose that attachment to thinking about my sore shoulder when I'm in cool and I just start doing it. So you see people, uh, people self-limit. We self-limit all the time, uh, and especially in healthcare, and especially in, in our, our physical motion uh, when you have an injury. So uh, that manipulation of the body map, um, mental strategies, resilience, so we're not just trying to immerse them for 24-7, we're trying to build some skills, and uh, motivation, positive psychology, and there's a correlation between emotion and chronic pain uh, and stress and the way we handle stress. So on the therapeutic side, those are our therapeutic strategies to uh, leverage the, the superpowers of VR. And on the therapeutic side, uh, down regulation, self-regulation, emotion regulation, uh, patient engagement, patient activation. Uh, all doctors want their patients to be a lot more activated. Um, uh, rehab, kinesiophobia, uh, neurological disorders, things that we can directly address with the psychophysical phenomenon. Um, and mindfulness skills, habits, knowledge comes from cognition, and that stress, depression, the inflammation, um, allostatic load, if people are uh, into the health uh, side of things, uh, and catharsis, the, the need to actually just go, ah! and, and all of that. Uh, good, you woke up. Okay, designing VR health experiences. So I, so I wanted to take you through the old model. So the old model, uh, we've all seen this. The old model evokes sensation, but it doesn't enhance performance. And the new model, uh, I just use a car, but basically you're also building the road. In VR, it's not just building the dashboard, but we're also building uh, the, uh, all, everything about where they're going. Um, so I want to do a little design thinking thing here and, and to use an example that, that I found really um, uh, illustrative and also pretty moving. Um, so we want to create transformative experiences. If you're familiar with design thinking, um, this has infiltrated a lot of uh, different kinds of businesses and all of that. Uh, basically, it has four steps. This is from IDEO uh, and Stanford, the founders of, of the design thinking sort of paradigm. Uh, gather information, generate ideas, make them tangible, share the story. Uh, won't really spend much time on that. but. Uh, so this is a story um, that I heard on This American Life, and I was in my car, and I, it, it just really hit me. Uh, number one is because I, I lived in Japan, and it's, it's a story about Japan. Um, it's called Kaze no Denwa, which is roughly translates to the telephone of the wind. Um, so the story goes like this. So this guy, Itaru Sasaki, uh, he lived um, in Otsuchi, which is up on the north side of, uh, of Honshu. Um, and he's 70, and what happened was his, um, his uh, uh, a relative, I think it was his nephew, died. And so he was feeling all this grief, and he wanted to find a way to express that. So he, um, you know, it, it was, in the design sense, uh, he was sort of trying to gather information about his own feelings. He was doing this internally. Uh, instead of somebody else designing it for him, but that makes this even better, I think. So what he did <clears throat> was he went out and he got a, um, a phone booth, and he got an old phone booth and he stuck it out in his, his yard, and he put it out in the garden, and uh, then he put a phone in it, and he would go out to his garden and he would pick up the phone and he would talk to his dead relative. And this is, I mean, this is, it's very powerful, but it's amazing. You know, he picks up a phone. Clearly, it's an old phone. It's not attached to anything. Uh, but going through that motion and picking up this thing and having a discussion uh, about this, you know, with his relative was cathartic for him. And he felt better and relieved. Um, now, fast forward, Otsuchi was hit by the tsunami in 2011, and it looked like this. And this, so his, uh, Sasaki's son's, his, his, uh, his phone booth predates this, uh, but after the, uh, after the tsunami, people started showing up in his yard, and uh, 10,000 people came from all over Japan and went into this phone booth. Now, why would you go across the country 
to go into this phone booth. There's a whole interesting ritual to it, but I think if you go back to, um, if you go back to what, uh, if you look at this space, the space is very intentional. There's nothing there that you don't need. It has affordances and sort of, um, uh, the way that the, the phone has, it, you know, it has a certain interaction built into it. It's very familiar, but um, it, you can sort of feel the environment. You can feel, you can sort of smell the grass behind it and, um, and all of that. And I think it's, it's really interesting what is there and what isn't there. It doesn't tell you to do anything. You just walk in and you do it. So people were showing up and they were doing this. And, and I think, you know, in, in terms of, uh, of you know, thinking about this as a designer, I think of it as sort of the anatomy of a transformative experience. Um, it starts with a meaningful place. So there's rituals, there's artifacts, there's, it's, there's this sensory component, and it's very intentional. Um, the second piece is there's a meaningful action, and it, it's self-driven, it's important to the person who's doing it. And so, uh, uh, and, and it's satisfying in some way, they come out of it changed. Uh, the third thing is it's very personal, so you have to allow space. And I think the one thing that I see in a lot of, of virtual worlds is they don't allow a lot of space. There's not a lot of space for me to bring my own dialogue because the designers or whoever is so worried about, you know, they're, they're giving me their dialogue. But if we're really going to embrace the power of the technology, which puts the, the human at the center, we have to give the human the chance to be human and, and do their own thing. So allowing space, I think, is really crucial. Uh, it's appropriate and it's also spontaneous that, that they, can, they can bring their own stories there and, and the designer didn't try to put all the stories there for them. Um, this American Life, I completely recommend this. It's called One Last Thing Before I Go. Ah, uh, that was heavy, but um, I think it's, it's a, a really great illustration of what good design is. I want to give you, um, back to the virtual world, I want to give you some examples of des the design process that we've done in different applications that we've built. Uh, this one is called Attack of the S Mutants. Uh, we got an obscene amount of money from the National Institute of Health to build a museum exhibit and, effect and see how effective it was for changing kids' behavior. Um, uh, and it was, it was awesome. We built this uh, 1,800 square foot exhibit. Uh, this is our character. Her name is Dentitia. We did tremendous research with the University of Washington Dental School and all of that. So uh, the first thing, I just wanted to share some of this. So this was building a character and, and trying to, if, you've, if any of you have worked on building characters uh, and really tried to make them effective, you know how much work it is. So we had, a, we had a sketch artist sitting down with kids and saying, what do you think Dentitia looks like? And so we had the cave girl Dentitia and the hardcore Dentitia and the nerd Dentitia. And then we came across the sort of steampunk Amelia Earhart. Uh, we think of her as Indiana Jones, the babysitter. So she's cool, but she's also kind of, uh, we wanted her to be a sort of a certain thing and a role model. So then the interesting thing was we took, we took that and it's a real process to take those, those sketches and turn them into a 3D, a 3D character that also retains those characteristics that you want. So the interesting thing was we took, um, you know, we, we showed these to people, we showed them with, um, I think, yeah, we showed them with different bodies, with the same bodies, we changed the head slightly and people would go, literally, these kids would go like, ah, she's stupid, or like, they literally said, she's hot, I would do her. <laughs> and I'm like, you're 10. This is, <laughs> this is a picture, you're 10, but you know you've hit something. Um, I was also at NIH and they asked me very, very bluntly, they said, what about the breast size? So I'll just tell you that what we found was really, it's very interesting. If you look at feminist literature too, you see that, that people, um, we wanted a, a character that embodied health and we wanted, it, we wanted her to look like a normal person, not like Laura Croft. And so we intentionally made her, uh, we intentionally, you know, made her proportions right um, for a healthy person. And people didn't respond well to that. And they, they did two things. One is they, they didn't really 
it wasn't as likable, but they also made, uh, in their minds, they, we asked them, how old do you think this person is? And so that they, they, would, um, they would consistently say they were much younger. They would see that, that sort of body shape as being young. So we subsequently, we wanted to make her um, you know, appealing, so we, we changed the proportions and tried to stay within the realm of what we thought was healthy. But um, it, there was a certain point where um, it, it, the, the thing about sort of the feminist literature part is that there's this correlation, this sort of dynamic that's difficult because uh, of, of attractiveness versus um, sort of uh, respectability or likability in a character and particularly for, for female characters. So you're working against all of these sort of social forces and you're trying to move them in some way. And what we decided was, um, you know, we, we really believe that we want to change the, the the way that women are portrayed in, in these kinds of, of things, but, but there's also a backdrop of people's expectations. So we decided not to fight that too hard. Um, but uh, so what we did was we, yeah, we, we changed the, the faces and, and all of that, and we ended up with, with Dentitia. We also created this environment, um, which was her lab, and we wanted her to be this kind of inventive person. Uh, this is what she ended up doing. So it's, she would make these crazy things out of, uh, that's her transfractal resonator that's made out of a vacuum cleaner and a, an old TV and, and the, the um, the spoon thing, I don't know what that does, and an umbrella, but, but she ends up going inside of her mouth. Um, here's a quick, uh, a quick video of it, and uh, it doesn't have any sound, but so what I was gonna, just I think what, what I wanted to point out was, so we have a character, we have somebody that she can um, relate to, there's a cut scene, uh, this is really about trying to, uh, what we're doing is we're feeding sugar to bacteria and they poop out acid. Kids love that, um, and th and so this is how we develop this kind of. Um, it's driven by it's driven by the the by the players. Everybody uh, kind of gets the same experience. But what we we did was uh, we had a, th a five person theater. We hacked a bunch of Wiimotes. Um, there's a big projection. Uh, they had uh, stereoscopic glasses and all that. But um, uh, so. The idea was to use the, the sort of social context of a museum to allow people to kind of have interactions and say, oh, go get the fluoride, go get the, you know, oh, it's, it's pooping out acid, so that they are internalizing some of these same kind of concepts. And, and um, we, it, it was gratifying to hear things like uh, kids would come out of it and go, well, yeah, I knew it was education, but it was still fun. And then they'd say, it made me want to brush better. So we were trying to really drive home that it's not about brushing longer, but it's about brushing better and doing a better job. So we felt like that kind of reaction and that kind of outcome was really, uh, it really showed that there was a change in how people perceived of the problem. Um, so VR for behavioral and public health, so that was a public health initiative. Uh, um, just some points, uh, definitely try to apply a proven chain, change model with proven measures, try to, if you're gonna do this, go get existing measures that are already validated to validate what you're doing. Uh, grab attention and then do something with it, do something important with it. Uh, build relevant and meaningful context in what you do. Uh, promote transformation through meaningful personal action. So always put the, the user at the center and combine intrinsic and extrinsic rewards because we know that intrinsic rewards are more powerful and lasting. Um, this is a quick view of, of a lot of the mental health stuff that we've done. We did, uh, this is called Iraq World. We did work with the Department of Defense. Um, so these were soldiers coming back from Iraq dealing with PTSD. Uh, this was um, quite a while ago, uh, but they're going through a generic Iraqi city uh, and feeling that, uh, you know, feeling like they're there. Um, this is Spider World, which we developed with, with Hunter again. Uh, arachnophobia, so direct triggers. Um, and this is another one from our friends over in, in Valencia, uh, uh, Christina Botea, they're using it for um, eating disorders. Uh, Giuseppe Riva is doing some of this work too. Uh, so this is rebalancing and recalibrating people's expectations about um, uh, sort of how the world works. 
uh, eating disorders are an internal kind of imbalance between, uh, you know, if I eat that hamburger, I think I'm going to gain 25 pounds. Well, that's physically impossible. So let's try to recalibrate those expectations with the, with the outcomes um, and make people healthier. Um, so mental health uh, embodied therapy, uh, simulations, uh, sort of the, the three genres of, of mental health. Uh, simulations, phobias with specific, specific triggers, and realigning distorted sense of self or reality. Um, so the takeaways, and then I've talked enough, um, and I would love to get your feedback. So uh, VR is a medium to enhance performance. Uh, there's a strong, there is strong evidence that VR can reduce the biggest pain problems and reduce the need for drugs. It's a powerful way to activate people to improve health, build skills, and promote habits. And to design great VR health experiences, uh, start with an understanding of the need, um, really base it on a solid therapeutic model if you can, um, and involve your target folks early and often. Um, that is, uh, I can talk about the benefits for the stakeholders, but basically I think the, the final thing is that we really want to change people after they take the helmet off. Um, it's one thing to give people a great VR experience, but it's really much more powerful if you're, if you're enabling them to do something in their real life, like get off of drugs or learn really cool things. Um, and that's what I have to share. Thank you so much. And do you want to... Uh, it works. It, it does work, I think. Hello? Okay. Uh, I live in the clinical world, and I'm not familiar with some of the research that you're posting up there, but I'm kind of curious, when we look at pain management, um, in study after study, the two particular areas that seem to work the best as far as controlling, especially chronic pain, are cognitive behavioral therapy and physical activity. So I'm kind of wondering with your, your VR, were there any research items that compared the VR, the activity that happens in the VR versus just the similar activity um, well, uh, okay, so in a few things. Uh, are there specific studies that look at um, having them play paintball with otters in the real world? No. Um, but uh, I think that, you know, we have done, you know, we've been part of studies that have looked at other types of typical distractions or engagements, nurses chatting, DVDs, uh, 2D, uh, 2D games, lots of different kinds of things. And so comparisons to that show that VR is more effective. Uh, one of the challenges of cognitive behavioral therapy is that it's very time consuming um, and that it has a high, in a way, a high patient burden. Um, and so what I think VR does really well is reduces that patient burden. So instead of, if you look at cognitive behavioral therapy different than pain, but, but it's very similar in post-traumatic stress, um, that a lot of people just don't want to engage with it. They don't want to engage with their, they don't want to sit around and say, I have PTSD or I have a mental health problem or I have a problem to begin with. And so uh, VR kind of transforms that talk therapy into action therapy. And it's kind of the same thing with pain. So instead of me sitting around and somebody telling me, well, just, you know, don't think about it or cognitively get myself out of it, they, they have an experience, they, they see that they can move, they, they see you know, that self-limitation, the kinesiophobia and all of that, um, they get over that and then that opens the opportunity for the chronic pain doctor to say, let's think about that. You weren't feeling pain there, you were actually moving, you were moving your neck in this way and we can show you that. Um, let's think about what that means and then so they build off of that. I don't think that we're replacing the therapist. I think we're enhancing their ability to deliver therapy. Yeah, 
Yeah, um, so everybody talks about the dose effect. And uh, that was a sort of a new term for me when I started working with NIH. They're like, what's the dose? What's the dose of a game? Um, I think the, so, so some benchmarks. Uh, we have um, a doctor named Adrian Hamburger who is uh, at Yale New Haven Spine Clinic. Uh, he started using it for biofeedback for his patients. He said, well, I can get reimbursed for 15-minute sessions, so guess what? I'm going to do 15-minute sessions. And uh, he's just started using it with his patients, and after three or four weeks, the, he he had patients coming back and saying, Doc, I'm not using my drugs anymore. And he's like, whoa, I didn't really expect that. And, and you know, I, I think it's amazing. It's wonderful. So what we find is that in some ways, you know, if you look at that study that I showed you of uh, Ted Jones, and all of this stuff is on our website, and I can share more of the data, but um, that sometimes it's really surprising how powerful it can be for people. Um, that it might not take as long as we sort of think. So if you're trying to take somebody through a procedure at a hospital, it's as long as the procedure goes, right? But if when you talk about sort of mindfulness and biofeedback, there's how long does it take us to adopt those things? And, you know, doctors are using it for, you know, that it, the chronic pain patients are, you know, using it for, you know, sort of 15-minute sessions. That's pretty typical and they're getting benefits from the first session, but it, it does compound. And how often are they coming, is there a protocol for how often they're coming in and how many sessions Yeah, we, we, we don't tell them you've got to do it this way, um, but we, we do see that they, you know, once, once a week, twice a week, they're getting that kind of benefit. And it's not just at Yale New Haven, that's at San Mateo and lots of other, other hospitals too. Yeah. Where that leg is no longer there, but the toe is just killing it. Right. Has there been any research done into that? Where I know they've done a thing with mirror therapy where you're trying to retrain the brain by looking, seeing the sound side on the side that's not there. Right. But I've often wondered if there's any research going on with this. Yeah. Um, so the uh, Ramachandran is the, the sort of big name in mirror therapy and phantom limb. Uh, yeah, and the phenomenon is, uh, you know, basically clenching spasms was sort of where it started. So if you're missing a hand, uh, you, you feel as if that, that hand that's not there is, is always clenching. And so using a mirror to, um, to visually fool the brain. Uh, what's cool about that is that I, I've talked to um, people who have, who have done a lot of that kind of therapy and that it works instantly. Like if it works, and, and so I would say, uh, what they say is that if it, it needs to work on a healthy person, so even if you don't have, have your hand, uh, if you take your hand away, that, that you get that physical sensation. So you can tell that you don't have to be an amputee to, to know if it's working. One of the challenges with VR, people have been doing that, people have been trying. Uh, they haven't really cracked that nut. Um, and it's sort of a, a deeper topic, but I think there's a, there, one of the challenges, not to get technical about it, but one of the challenges is, is where's the location? The mirror's out there and your hands are out there. I, if you put a camera on the head, it doesn't work because of the angle. And so there's a whole bunch of reasons why I think that contributing factors to it. I think there are some solutions to it, which um, we, we may or may not work on. But phantom limb is a great example of how our brains are really taking a, a big role in, in that sort of pain cycle. Uh, and if you can change the way the brain is working, uh, and induce some plasticity, and those, those benefits do last with, um, with the mirror therapy. So, um, yeah, it's a kind of a bigger topic. Uh, is some of your work available to try at home, or is there a commercial conflict for the Ivory Sea to demo to us, maybe? Um, yeah, uh, so I, I can spend some time doing some demos out there, and there's another, another system out there. We, do not really, because of what I said, you know, we're, we're really focused on hospitals and clinics, and it's just another thing to support people at home. If people have VR headsets, um, 
you know, we can we can send you a demo or something. But uh, uh, I've got cards here. You can you can send me information. If if it's not a lot of work for us, and we can just and if you've got a if you've got a system at home, then then that's much easier to deal with. But like, yeah, I, I don't want to be dealing with grandmothers. I've done a lot of that, and um, <laughs> it's hard. My grandmother would love to play ping pong with I. I want to meet your grandmother. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that my answer would be, so we, we do have fMRI studies. fMRI studies are really hard to do, um, especially with VR. But you know, it's, you know, it's just, people just hate going into MRI machines too. So um, it's hard to do that kind of thing, really, and, and get accurate brain scans. But I think what, when you see People, so we do have a lot of suggestion that it works, and, and we do want to promote neuroplasticity. There's an awesome book that's called uh, The Brain That Changes Itself, which I highly recommend, uh, which um, has some sort of VR components to it. But uh, the, I think the indication is really, does the pain stop? I mean, you can see the manifestation. It's good that the change has to be happening somewhere, right? I mean, it's got to be happening inside the person. Um, and you know, would you see that in the in the voxels on your on your MRI? I don't know, but you can say that that there are significant changes when their response to pain changes, and and we know that. You know, you can look at, at other kind of mental health studies and, and other, you know, health interventions that if you get a lasting effect, it's got to be, it's got to be held in the brain, right, or, or in the body, but it's got to be held somewhere. So, I mean, that's sort of a tautology, but if you are seeing a change, then the change is there. What's the next step? What's the next generation of what you're doing? Um, the next generation is adoption. And the biggest challenge that I face every day is, you know, I started out in a world where I had to s tell people what VR was. Um, you know, we've moved from the realm of science fiction to something that most people are familiar with. So now my conversations used to take a long time with, with doctors and they'd go, what is this VR stuff anyway? Uh, and then it was like, we've heard about VR uh, can you tell us how it works in healthcare? And then it's like, we've heard about VR in healthcare, but we've never done it, and we don't know what it's like. So, and then my process with a hospital is, you know, uh, this happened with Providence. They called me, I went up there, I, I showed it to them, and then they go, okay, we get it, we see the data, we try it, we get it, and, and then can you come back and actually see it with a patient? Um, and then, okay, now it's with the patient, now we'll, we believe it, and now we're gonna try a, a pilot. So those steps, thankfully, those, those steps have become easier, but still, I think the big, the big challenge is we can build, uh, like I've got a thousand ideas of things that I'm gonna build when I can, but we, you just can't keep building it and hope they come. So we need to bring healthcare along, and healthcare is, you know, I, I talk about healthcare is, is diametrically opposed to technology. Technologists, I live in you know, Silicon Valley, not proud of that, but uh, I live in Silicon Valley and it's like everybody loves disruption. They just want to disrupt stuff. Just give us something and we'll disrupt it. And healthcare is tradition based. And those two worlds often collide. And digital health is where that collision is happening. So I think that. Um, this, in order for this to really achieve its benefit in, in, in the next step, I think it's both adoption, protocols, standardization, people believe it. Uh, the, the, the tipping point, just so you know, the tipping point in, in healthcare tends to be about 30%. When, a, when an innovation hits 30%, then everybody will adopt it because they don't want to be behind their competition. We're nowhere near the 30%, but we're well past the early adopters. 
And so what we need to do is to drive it towards that tipping point. Can I ask one more question? Okay, two questions. Okay, go. Have you ventured into the neural atypical or Um We do have, we have a, a psychiatrist, her name is uh, Ann Maloney. She's working with, uh, um, a lot of those patients, a lot of whatever, those people, the, a lot of people who are on the spectrum have uh, social cognitive problems. So they, the inhibition control, emotion regulation, uh, they get overwhelmed. Um, and she's using it with uh, kids who get overwhelmed and like lock themselves in the, in the bathroom because they can't deal with the world. So um, this VR experience actually gives the, the parent, in that case, they can talk through the door and they say, okay, imagine you're in glow and you're gathering fireflies and you're, okay, let's relax. And it, it actually gives them a dialogue to have that conversation, much the way a therapist uh, kind of work changes when you introduce VR. It doesn't get rid of the therapist, it enhances the therapist's ability to, uh, to do and administer their therapy. Right, um, so that's, that's, a, that's something we, we do do. We do monitor it, we do gather a bunch of data. Um, the question is what you do with, uh, in, in, uh, in rehab, you wanna give people enough data but not too much data and a lot of, um, uh, yes, we do gather data, yes, we do show it to people. Um, there's a lot of potential to do more there. I think that as people um, use VR and become more aware of it, uh, we, we, in addition to, um, I should have said this, in addition to like the motion data, we gather sensor data. So we're using, um, I've got it here somewhere. Uh, oh yeah, so this is a, this is a, a heart rate sensor. Uh, just for the technology people in the world, this is, a, um, this is by a company called Skosh. There's only two uh, heart rate sensors out there that actually will stream the data. Skosh is one, um, the Mio is another, but this one is really cool. So if you're gonna try to build something with, uh, with heart rate sensor, I would recommend that. Um, so the, the best thing actually is to get multiple streams. So we've done a lot of work with biosensors, with EEG and, and heart rate and all that. And so to, to get not just the motion data, but to get the biosensor data and correlate that because then you can make some real judgments. And uh, ultimately, we're working on a system to modulate the experience. So increase the intensity and change, change the dynamics and all sorts of, uh, of cognitive levels and, and, and modulate it in real time. So it's not just uh, measuring what you're doing, but it's actually changing in real time to increase your, uh, your recovery and, and do better therapy. Um, maybe time-wise, that's what we have time for. Thank you so much. Uh, I'm gonna be around, uh, thank you.